I don't think American companies necessarily have to worry about doing business in Saudi Arabia and then violating sanctions related to Iran, although that is something that requires screening. And that requires screening your buyers, your partners in the country, et cetera, and the other ties that they may have. And that requires not only good due diligence, but also geopolitical risk intelligence. So it requires screening of partners and suppliers and things of that nature. Companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast. This is a five-part series on geopolitical risk intelligence, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox with our inaugural episode in this special five-part series sponsored by Infertile Worldwide on Global Political Risk Intelligence. In this series, we're going to take a look at the global outlook, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Ian Oxnavad. Ian, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me on this series. Thank you for having me. Ian, could we start this episode by you telling us a little bit about your academic and professional background? So I am the Director of Geopolitical Risk Intelligence for Infertile Worldwide. I come from academia originally. I have a PhD in political science. I'm a political scientist and a political economist. Basically, that's just a fancy term for looking at political issues and economic issues side by side and how they intertwine. Before my PhD, I did a master's degree in national security studies where I was trained in intelligence. I hold BAs in Arabic and English. I often get calls from lawyers looking for expert witnesses on issues related to the Middle East, terrorism, and things of that nature. In, in this first episode, we're going to take up the Middle East and Africa, and we may use the acronym MENA for those who have worked overseas or, like yourself, have studied extensively. So what are you seeing sort of risk opportunities in 2023 that would lead companies to perhaps look to that region of the world for a business opportunity or perhaps a business partner? Something to keep in mind about MENA or the Middle East in particular Less so with North Africa, but in the Middle East core, the Middle East that existed before 2020 no longer exists. The Middle East kind of conjures up a number of images and clashes between different rival ethnic or religious groups. That dynamic has changed a lot since 2020, with the first big change being the Abraham Accords, which were signed kind of in the middle of the pandemic. Not many people were paying attention I worked on a book on the Middle East where we actually talked about this possibility. We were looking at data on threat perceptions. And what we noticed is that Israel and the Gulf states, particularly the UAE and Bahrain, could potentially have normal relations. And sure enough, they did. So the Abraham Accords open up a number of opportunities, particularly in the high tech sector and in water technology. So basically, what the Abraham Accords did was they normalized relations between the UAE, the Emirates, Bahrain, and Israel. And these are the most high-tech economies in the region. So their economies, the bilateral relations are growing. You have bilateral tourism now and investment. And it's not really surprising given that you have a youngish population with a lot of money. They're looking for investments. They're regionally integrated in terms of some cultural background. Israel's fairly conservative. The Gulf is also very conservative, but they're also very advanced in terms of how they view technology. So economically, it's not very surprising. So you do have a number of opportunities there for bilateral ties and bilateral investments. So if you're a Western company looking at investing in Israel or the Gulf, back 20 years ago, you'd have to be very careful about keeping your sort of economic relations separate. That's no longer the case, and it opens up for greater market integration in those sectors. Elsewhere, much more recently, China has entered the Middle East, which is not surprising given the Belt and Road Initiative, but Saudi Arabia and Iran, they're normalizing ties. And I think just today they opened their first consulate so they can actually have normal relations. And this is partly the result of domestic U.S. foreign policy and attention, but also U.S. attention on the Pacific Rim overlooks China integrating the Middle East into the Belt and Road. And what this does in the energy sector is this could make energy costs much, much more unaffordable in certain sectors around the world. 
as you're looking at how Saudi Arabia and Iran may start to coordinate on energy production. So while you have great news in the high tech sector between the Gulf states and Israel, you have more negative implications for energy costs. And that obviously goes up supply chains as well between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So the war that existed since 1979, for lack of a better term, between Saudi Arabia and Iran somewhat ended thanks to China. And this also threatens the dollar potentially. If oil sales start getting denominated in currencies other than the dollar, that could cause inflationary pressures as well as just higher energy costs, which is an inflationary pressure itself. So that's a big risk coming from the region. You also have good opportunities, though, with the Abraham Accords. And that's kind of the region in a nutshell, more hyper-focused on specific countries. Iran needed some good news after the death of Masa Amini. You had protests over the death of a protester against basically modesty laws in Iran. That kind of parallels what happened in the U.S. with George Floyd. You had an underlying political tension and then, you know, an incident that caused mass upheaval. And the Iranian regime needed that sort of Chinese support in terms of creating new economic opportunities to sort of stabilize itself. Israel currently is also going through some instability as a result of some court reforms pushed by the Netanyahu government. And basically what that would allow is the Knesset to block specific court decisions that started massive protests, and it's exacerbating existing divides domestically within Israel. And you kind of see this playing out around the region, right? So you also see protests in Turkey over corruption. That's a big issue. So what you're seeing is greater integration economically that didn't exist for prior to the pandemic, and you're seeing greater internal instability in specific countries. Let me pick up on the currency issue, because I haven't heard that for quite some time. I've been interested in the benchmark currency for Brent crude or Saudi Arabian crude for a long, long time since I've ever used it. Mm-hmm. And I can remember in the early to mid first decade of this century when the king decided to remain on dollar standard. And I viewed that as a huge boon to America. I think he used a phrase, it would could cause inflationary pressures. Can maybe expand on that a little bit because I find that an incredibly important point and a huge advantage to America over the EU, the euro, or pound, perhaps the Chinese yuan, and why it is, I think, in our critical interest to keep the benchmark for Saudi Arabian and Middle Eastern crude tied to the dollar. The dollar's power, like any currency's power, is obviously tied to its ability to hold value and people's interest in actually holding it, the incentives to hold it. And with oil being denominated, oil sales, all prices being denominated in dollars, if you're going to buy oil, you have to have the dollars to do it. And that creates demand for the dollar. And what that does for the US, first of all, for consumers and for companies, that allows higher levels of purchasing power. So if you're a company and you want to offshore and manufacture abroad, your dollars that you can pay in that local economy are going to go much farther, obviously, right? So it helps those who import into the U.S. It hurts exporters from the U.S. as exports become more expensive. But dollars since World War II, and even you could argue somewhat before that, anyone would take them, whether it's a shack in the Amazon selling lemonade or a multi-billion dollar deal in the Middle East, it really didn't matter because dollars were the king. And now that may be changing. We have massive amounts of debt. We have inflation around the world. But one of the things that China wants to do is displace the dollar with the yuan. And the yuan can't quite do it because it's a totalitarian regime and its monetary policy is very unstable because it's guided by pure political decisions. But what China is doing is very crafty and that they're not trying to necessarily just supplant the dollar outright. What they're doing is they're trying to get others to offer transactions in their own currencies. There's a greater incentive to hold more currencies as opposed to just dollars. And if this continues, then that's going to create an inflationary pressure because the less demand there is for dollars, the more dollars you're going to have in circulation, right? The more dollars in circulation, without an increase in production, that's inflation. And with the Middle East and energy, you kind of get a double whammy in that they cut energy production and they're denominating sales in something other than dollars. 
you're looking at supply side shocks plus a currency crisis uh, potentially for the U.S. Now, I mean, the dollar reserves around the world are about 60 percent, and that's good, but it shouldn't go any lower because otherwise that massive debt that we have, which is somewhere like $30 trillion plus now, that will eventually come due and we won't be able to print our way out of it because no one will have the incentive to hold those dollars that we're printing. So we're entering a period of monetary instability unless things change and there's actually a foreign policy focused keeping the dollar in place. Having identified this risk, how would you uh, counsel a company or international business looking to do business in that part of the world to manage that risk or perhaps even just plan for that risk? On certain levels, it's relatively easy to insulate against it. All you have to do is start to hold other currencies and do transactions in those other currencies. Depending on what sector you're in, however, if you're an exporter to different parts of the world from the U.S., this will actually help you. If you are entirely reliant on importing things, manufacturing abroad, importing into the U.S., you will want to look at potentially reshoring to the U.S. itself, looking at basically what your markets could be, right? So if you have heavier currencies in Europe and a higher inflated dollar, maybe you're looking at trying to enter new markets there where your exports from the U.S. could go farther. So it's a matter of market analysis and geopolitical risk monitoring, which are things that we do at Infratol. We kind of do those macro things. We also have boots on the ground as well for other things. But that's kind of it in a nutshell. You have to just kind of position yourself for those changes. You talked about Iran. And is there, I want to maybe tie it to this uh, Chinese opening with a potential business now between the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Iran. Does this present a greater export sanction or trade sanction risks to American companies who have done business in Saudi Arabia to make sure that their goods or products don't somehow get to Iran or somehow violate current sanctions? Potentially. In terms of Iran specifically, I'm not sure how much ties with Saudi Arabia are going to allow Iran to get potentially threatening technologies or advanced technologies because Iranian drones are being used in Ukraine. Most of those components in those quote unquote Iranian drones are actually from American companies. So as it stands, Iran is probably getting some of that from China would be my guess because Saudi Arabia is still going to be wary of Iran ongoing decades of war, unspoken war. An undeclared war don't go away overnight, and you still have sectarian tensions over the holy sites, and they're still competitors regionally. Whether or not China can keep them as growing sort of partners remains to be seen, but I don't think American companies necessarily have to worry about doing business in Saudi Arabia and then violating sanctions related to Iran, although that is something that requires screening, and that requires screening your buyers, your partners in the country, et cetera and the other ties that they may have. And that requires not only good due diligence, but also geopolitical risk intelligence. So it requires screening of partners and suppliers and things of that nature. And then the Emirates, with this treaty, or rather Abraham Accords, that were signed during the Trump administration, do you see greater opportunities for U.S. businesses in the Emirates or some greater opportunity for trade both with Israel in the Emirates? Or has that trade always been available, or at least uh, not always, but in the last several years been available, and it's an ongoing relationship? From the U.S. standpoint, it's been an ongoing relationship with both. But what the Abraham Accords allow is for integrated investment in other parts of the world. So for example, the Emirates heavily invest in Africa, and East Africa in particular, where water technology is a premium, where you may have had geopolitical issues getting in the way of potentially working with Emirati investors, putting in water systems in Africa, for example, that originally come from Israel, that hurdle no longer exists. So you're looking at a greater regional technological integration as the result of these ties that will expand beyond Israel and the Gulf states themselves into East Africa and elsewhere in the MENA region plus Africa. So from that standpoint, in those key sectors and also in finance, where a lot of financing in Africa comes from the Emirates, that's a lot of opportunities to be had there. Ian, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope our listeners to join us for our next episode where we take a look at global risk in Latin America. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you for having me.